Thank you, thank you. This picture here was actually taken when I was active in my addictions and I was struggling with various forms of mental health issues. But I always had this smile on my face and perhaps some of you can relate to that idea where you wake up in the morning, you're in pain, perhaps you're going through financial hardships, relationship issues, or even your own mental health struggles, but you have to go to work. So you put on that beautiful mask as I did, you smile, you walk into those doors and someone walks up to you and they say, good morning, how are you doing? And 99% of the time, how do you respond? Good, fine. Next time, try just saying horrible. Watch what they do. They'll do that double step. No, no, you're good. We've become very robotic, not only in the question, but also in the response. Robin Williams said, all it takes is a beautiful smile to hide an injured soul. And that was me. The story that I represented on the outside was very different than what was taking place on the inside. One doctor even gave me one month to live if I didn't change what I was doing. But see, on the outside, people saw the person who is president of the school, athlete of the year, captain of sports teams, and even as an active addict when I was living in Edmonton, I received a national scholarship as an outstanding community citizen. And it was a joke. But see, my challenge was I had no idea how to talk about my pain. This image was actually taken early in my sobriety. And it serves as that perfect metaphor of what it was like all those years struggling because I stayed in those shadows of shame, embarrassment, guilt. Our voice is our greatest tool, but why do we talk about our pain if we fear that we're going to be met with judgment? So I stayed quiet. Yet silence will always be that enemy because I didn't talk about my pain, who suffered more than anybody else? Me. So I wanna talk about two key things. One is how can we create the space where people feel comfortable asking for what they need? And secondly, hopefully to empower you to use your own voice in times of need. And I want you to think about, currently, how do you approach people who are in pain? Whether this is your children, your partner, your spouse, colleague, what do you do? What do you do if you walk into a room and you see a woman with her head on the table crying? What's your approach? What do you do if you walk in that same room, but this time it's a man with his head on the table crying? Is your approach different? And secondly, should it be different? And I would argue, no. Sometimes, you know, we get these surprises in life. Things like a phone call take place and everything changes. I came across this picture a few months ago, and this was taken a few months before my best friend, Justin Andres, acted on suicide. Justin was the best man at my wedding and not more than a year later, I'm given the tribute at his funeral. I learned a lot. I learned how to grieve sober. But for me, the biggest takeaway was that you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. I knew he was struggling, not to that degree, but see, I could have dragged him to a hospital. I could not force him to stay. I could have dragged him to a counselor. I could not force him to speak. There's only so much that we can do with the people around us. So what I've learned is to say and do everything in those moments so that we do not have to look back thinking should have done more. The approach is difficult for a lot of us. You know, sometimes we get uncomfortable and so we say nothing. If we approach people and just say, I don't mean to pry. I just want to let you know I'm concerned. I just want to let you know I'd be more than happy to listen if you ever needed to talk. That's it. I think that we have two basic needs. One, see me. Two, hear me. You put a statement like this out there, you just said, I see you, and you have now given them an invitation to be heard. Whether or not they act on that invite, is that in your control or out of your control? Completely out of your control. But if they do act on that, then it's important to drop what we're doing and validate the step that they took. Because I get it, we're busy. But what's the message if, you know, ah, you know, I got too many things to do, come back in five minutes. Then they're going two steps back. And for me, my mental health issues, substance abuse challenges started when I was in grade 11. Now throughout all that, all the signs are there. I'm deviating from leadership roles, academics are sliding, change of peer groups, but not one teacher approached me. And what's the message that we get when we're in pain and nobody approaches us? Nobody cares. I know that they cared, but they had no idea what to do with me. And it was years later at the U of A in a class more than 300, where a professor by the name of Ian McNeil approached me and he said, come to my office, Al, let's talk. I had no idea why, but I recall going up to that third floor, his office door is open, 
I walk in. There's a chair. He says, have a seat, Al. So I sat down, and then he says, how are you doing today, Alan? That's different than how we started, right? How are you doing? It changes when you add the person's name and when you add the word today. 7% of the way that we communicate is verbal. 7%. The other 93% mannerisms, posture. I knew throughout his mannerisms that there was compassion. There was no judgment. And that was one of the first times in my life that I removed that mask. And I actually talked about what was going on. He did not fix me, but he listened. This is where two ears, one mouth for a reason. And then he gave me resources. And this is that fork in the road, right? Because it's ultimately up to the individual whether or not they want to act on the resources. But I'll tell you this, in 10 minutes, Ian McNeil changed my entire life because he took the time to see someone who was in pain. He took the time to listen. Sometimes a client of mine, a student, somebody in my personal life will accept this invite. They'll fly into my office and they'll say something like this. Al, you cannot possibly understand what I've gone through. And if we respond with, oh, yes, I can. I went through substance abuse issues. I went through divorce, whatever it is. No, this is not about us. This is about them. And if you respond with these four powerful words, help me to understand. Watch what happens because now there's a shift of energy in the moment, the moment that they start to talk about their pain, what happens? Healing. Can darkness survive in light? Yes or no? No. And this is the gift that we can give them. My entire mantra is around this, that talking facilitates healing. And when I say surround yourself with people who speak your language, what I mean is no matter what you're going through, I promise you, there are other individuals who are experiencing similar challenges. My problem was I feared that if I talked about what was going on, I was going to be locked up. So I remained silent. But then I got myself into some interesting spaces. I remember sitting in my car crying, fearing opening up that door, walking into my first 12-step program because I knew that if I talked about what was going on, it was going to be real. But nothing for me was as difficult as getting myself in the Saskatoon Sexual Assault Center for other men who've been sexually abused. I don't even have words to express the feelings or emotions that was going on, but what I do know is that there are so many people who continuously struggle with these issues, whether that's in the workplace, our communities, and shame is toxic. I remember getting into that space terrified. Only one other man was there, so that didn't help my anxiety. The counselor starts it off by saying, you know, let's just share what brought you here today. So I try, I'd say maybe 30, 40 seconds tops, I talk, then I just broke, shut down, done. Then the only other person who is there says the six words that saved my life. He says, it's okay, Al, I get it. There is nowhere in the world that I could have gone to receive that gift. And that's how it works, right? Often we have to take incredible risks to receive that ultimate reward. Brene Brown says the two most powerful words, me, Two, why? Connection. And all of a sudden, I was not alone in that moment. I remember when I had that V on my forehead, I was the victim. Woe is me, nobody would understand me. And then I was speaking with an elder and he said, Al, you are not the only person who's been sexually abused. You are not the only person who struggled with addictions and you are not the only person who's gone through mental health issues. If you want something different, Go get it because this world owes you nothing. I was pretty mad. <laughs> I was really mad. But then I went home. Is there truth in that statement? Yeah. I mean, he could have said it nicer. <laughs> but there is truth. And see, what changed is I started to open up my eyes. I started to access all the resources because we are very fortunate to have everything from EAP, counselors, social workers, audio, books, but a victim says, nah, it's too difficult. This is what I have today. That is incredibly powerful and significant for me because eight years ago isn't that long ago. And eight years ago, I was living on my own in Edmonton, struggling with addictions, a lot of dark nights. And had someone said, hang on, Al, hang on. One day you'll have a beautiful wife. One day you'll have four healthy children. One day you'll have a home, not a house. As if. But it's interesting when you start to allow yourself to become vulnerable, take risks, 
talk about your pain, how it can become liberating and freeing. And so in closing, my challenge and my wish for you is simply that you will continuously be challenged but never defeated. And if you live with this philosophy, it means that you will continuously remain in a state of living opposed to existing. Thank you very much. Thank you.